Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 1, it says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. That word pleasing is a really big deal. If you go back and study, if you go back and listen to the teachings on, on the YouTube, you'll actually see the, the history of the pleasure of God and what was pleasing and how he designed the tree of knowledge of good and evil, all those things in creation, how he designed some things to be pleasing to the eye and a different things are pleasing to the spirit. Okay, so I'll break that down in detail. But when it comes down to worship, what we're doing is we're, we're, we're doing our best to submit to the Holy Spirit in making our lives pleasing to God. That's what this is all about. And it says it's holy and pleasing to God, and this is your true and proper worship, or this is your spiritual act of worship. Do not any longer conform to the pattern of this world, which is not pleasing to God, but be transformed in the renewing of your mind, and then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, perfect, and pleasing will. And he will lead you, fuel you, and empower you to live a life that's worship. Now, you're like, what does all this have to do with the series title at the altar? Well, that living sacrifice part, that transforming your mind part is very bloody. It's an ongoing intentional act of your will submitting to the Holy Spirit of God and conforming into the likeness of Christ. And it, and it requires a, a continual, everybody just say warfare. It's a battle. It's a battle of let it live in me or it must die in me. It's a battle of I'm going to live for my own whatever or I'm going to die to me and live to God. That's a battle. So 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 through 5 says, Although we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons that we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Say that phrase out loud. To demolish strongholds. And every lofty opinion that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Now, I will let you know, I am ripping these verses out of context. And I'm going to preach them in context next week. Because the context of this starts in chapter 8, verse 1. And it's all about money, 100%. This verse right here is 100% about the spirit of mammon that's on the church in Corinth. And all he's doing is asking them to follow through with their commitment to giving resources out of their abundance for the benefit of other people and the advancement of the gospel. And evidently, they wrote him a letter saying, we've met some super apostles who are more about us than they are about you, and we don't think that you're a legitimate apostle. And Paul's like wanting to call down fire from heaven and beat them all up with some Jesus stuff. You know what I'm saying? And he says, I'm tempted to beat you up, but keep your word. You said you were going to give. You said God is first. You said you're following Christ, but now you're making an excuse that I'm weak and I'm timid in person. I'm not impressive. And you found some more impressive evangelists, and you're now giving your money to those false apostles, and you're, you're actually causing the gospel of Christ to not flourish because you're actually doing what makes you look good and you feel good. And he's one, he, literally, read chapter 8, 9, and 10. That's what the whole chapters are about. It's about a pledge of bringing God their very best. And what he says is that even I, the apostle Paul, when I'm tempted to fight the way the world does, I have to demolish strongholds. I have to take thoughts captive. I have to continually live at the altar. And this morning I want to share a message with you called Destroying Strongholds at the Altar. Come on, say it out loud with me. Destroying Strongholds at the Altar. One more time. Destroying Strongholds at the Altar. Let's pray. Father, I love you so much. I'm so thankful for you. I'm thankful for your patience thankful for your kindness and I love wrestling with you I love it I, lo I love coming up and just contending with you for who you are and it's not fighting against you it's really wrestling with you and Lord it always ends in me being submitted in deeper worship to you I love bringing my opinions of you to you as reasons for why I want to keep on doing what I'm currently doing. And I love when you win that wrestling match. 
I love when I wrestle with you and all of my ideas for how you could have done things and how you should do things. And I love when you submit me and I end in worship. I love when I'm worried, when I'm anxious, when I'm stingy, when I'm greedy. I love when I'm about myself and I wrestle with you and bring you all the reasons why I should be and you win every time. The result is worship, Lord. And I ask that you introduce this church, this body, of how beautiful it is to really wrestle with you and allow you to be our fortress, our stronghold, our deliverer, our mighty God, our rock, our salvation, our fortress in whom we trust. We acknowledge your, your God. We trust you. Lord, right now, I just want to pray. I pray over every mindset that's in this room that is contaminated today by worry, anxiety, and fear. I pray for something to surpass all works of psychology in fixing mental health, that you bypass that by your spirit and that you deliver people today, that you deliver them, that you deliver them from unhealth, that you deliver them from toxic anxiety, that you deliver them from the fear and the attachment and the consequences of bowing down to protection and comfort in this life. And I pray that you redeem them, that you purchase them out of that today, that you set marriages free from fighting, that you set hearts free from worry, and that you do that miraculous work today by the power of your cross. Holy Spirit, come and fill this room. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Come on, high five your neighbor and say you came on a good day. Came to church on a good day. Well, first of all, I want to let you know that the word stronghold in the Bible is a metaphor. It's mostly a metaphor, but most of the time in the Old Testament, it's not a metaphor. It's a, it's a, literal, it's a literal war tactic. It's a, national, it's a national tactic. It's a national place. It's a national reality. And in the Old Testament, it describes like where people set up altars in the Old Testament. It's a place of worship to their God. And they build fortresses around those things to protect that place of worship in order for them to bring power and glory and honor to whatever their God is. And this is why when Joshua and other leaders in the Old Testament are conquering territory, the first thing they do is tear down the strongholds of that territory, remove the altars to the false gods, and set up worship, tabernacle worship before David temple worship after that. And the very first thing that the Babylonians and the Assyrians and others would do when they would conquer Jerusalem, they literally would set up all kinds of ridiculous things inside the temple. They would tear down the altar. In history, several hundred years before Jesus was born, when they destroyed the temple in Jerusalem, they literally sacrificed pigs on the altar to their false gods, declaring that their God was greater than the one true God. The reason they went and took the stronghold was because it was the high place. Jerusalem is the high place in Israel. It's the place of, the high place, come on, have you ever played King of the Mountain when you were a kid? You know, I won a lot of times, you know, I know with all the little peasant children around the neighborhood grabbing at my ankles, and I was like, you know, Jack and the Beanstalk, I was like the big giant, like, get off of me, get off of me. That's kind of how David and others felt in Jerusalem. They felt if you occupy the high place, it's easier to kick people away if you occupy the high place. And so the question is this, is like, what actually has the high place in your heart? What occupies the high place in your heart? Sadly, many of you, if I asked you to write down the answer, you would say God. And God would immediately invite you to the altar. If you say God, you alone have the high place. He would immediately take you to the altar. And he would start challenging your lofty opinions that are set up against him. And in that process, it would start a conversation about what you really rely on and what you really trust in. And his evidence would be what makes you fall apart when it's not present. And he would say, that in this area is your stronghold. That is your God. 
If you really want that, what you'll realize is there are many what's called idols in our hearts and in our lives. And so I want to show you in just a second, I'll show you a slide, and it's called the anatomy of a stronghold, okay? So go ahead and write down that phrase. You're going to want to take a picture of the screen. If you've been an anchor for a long time, you've been taught this a lot because this is the foundation. It's the root of spiritual warfare. It's the root of freedom ministry. It's the foundation of how to overcome addictions, addictive patterns, to renew generational blessing, to break generational curses, to stop addictions, and to stop doing all the things you don't want to do. And I think everybody in here would agree that there are many times during your day, and maybe even the course of one hour, where you end up doing things that you don't want to do, and probably things that you said just an hour ago you would never do again, or you never think again. And there's this battle that goes on in all of us, and it happens in the atmosphere of a stronghold. I'll give you just a relational example, you know, referring to myself, okay? So I, I, some people get confused when I tell stories because you don't, you don't know. Sometimes I use analogies and I use little short snippets of my past to, make a, uh, to, make it, to give an example. And so I'm going to give a little short example. And there, there, was, there was a time during my childhood, I had, a, I, had a great, I had a great childhood. I had great parents, good parents who had all kinds of lies and deception in their own heart. They did, right? Just like you do with your own kids. They had all kinds of issues that they're dealing with just like you do in your own life. And so my parents were normal. They just had a probably maybe some deeper, darker secrets that, that I never knew about until I was in my 30s or 40s. And so when I got to my, into my childhood, that, that 8, 9, and 10-year-old self, Jeff, Jeffrey, whatever you want to call him, <laughs> little, little boy, I was exposed to th some things between about 8 and 11 that literally altered the entire course of my life. Now, it doesn't mean I wasn't successful. I was very successful. I had, a, I had good, good grades, lots of friends, was successful in sports. I started getting recruited by many, many colleges as a freshman in high school. So I had lots of success. I had a full music scholarship to LSU, full football scholarship to 40 different universities. And so I had a lot of success on paper. I was leading a student ministry inside I had a stronghold that was rooted in, you're not enough. That's what I was rooted in. And there was a lie that was spoken into my life by an, an older person who punched me in the head and said, you are a blankety blank blank and you're never going to blank. Well, when that phrase gets in your head, what you do is you spend the next 10 years of your life proving that wrong. And at the same time, believing it. So for whatever reason, you may have actually had something happen to you where someone beat you in a contest or someone rejected you in a locker room or someone rejected you on a school playground or whatever it is, these strongholds get developed by unwanted behaviors, things that are painful in life, regardless of it is. A lot of times it happens with people of authority, people who are over you, uh, people you respect, people you trusted, and then all of a sudden something unwanted comes into your life and that's... That's, that's, a, that's a painful point. And in that painful point, it doesn't really have an effect on you until you hear the message of that pain. And when that message gets inside of you and you don't have a faith filter to discern it and spit it out, it becomes part of your deep belief system. And when it becomes part of your deep belief, belief system, it then fuels all of your insecurities and all of your decision-making patterns, and you end up comforting yourself because you're really hurting. And so you may not even know why you want this all the time. And you go back and look at when did you first start doing that over and over and over. For some people, relationally, recently, I've seen a lot of people actually dealing with what's called suicidal anxiety or suicidal ideation and cutting and those types of things. And I said this Wednesday night, but the word decide, decide, D means to, cide means cut, decide means to cut. Suicide means to cut self. Cide means to cut self. And what the difference in, in cutting and suicide is you're just not cutting deep enough. But if the, the mentality is an anger that something inside of you is comforting yourself because you don't feel like you're worthy of this, this, and this, and this anger. And the reality is that when you first started not liking yourself or first starting not liking your life, instead of taking it out on those parents or whatever, you took it out on yourself. And it, whether it's cutting or if it's overeating or binging or purging or uh, working out to whatever it is, it's any excessive behavior that makes you feel good in the moment. And so I call this the anatomy of a stronghold. Here's a diagram for you. 
Take a picture of it. You can write it down. I'm going to unpack it for the next couple of weeks, okay? So the night of your stronghold is when you experience pain, there's a message that's sent to your heart in that pain, regardless of what it is. It could be over and over and over. Then what happens is that that becomes a filter every time you experience something that reminds you of that behavior. Now, Pastor Jeff, it sounds like you're trying to do therapy on us. No, it's I, I, well, I'm not. It's the Bible. <laughs> it's the Bible. What Paul says is we arrest thoughts. We take thought domains captive that are lofty opinions set up against the truth of Jesus Christ. We demolish those. It's like we take a pitchfork and we shove it into the lie and submit that lie to Jesus and we get a healthy belief system that comforts ourselves in something other than lies. Can I get an amen? This is spiritual warfare. And what happens for lots of us is you are over here comforting yourself with things that are killing you. You're comforting yourself with behaviors, actions. It's escaping reality. You're doing things over here and you don't want... You don't want to feel pain, but the reality is that the way you comfort yourself even leads to more pain. The greatest rejection in the, lo- in the world, I just, you can write this down, I, it's a true statement. If love is man's greatest need, say it out loud, rejection is man's greatest fear. If love is man's greatest need, then rejection is man's greatest fear. And so... All of us comfort ourselves with things that we think make us feel accepted. But what happens is, is all of that unhealthy stuff comes out in other relationships of bragging, defensiveness, all these other things. And it, people reject you or they distance from you or they unfriend you or they unlike you or whatever. And you're like, whatever. And then you get right back in the cycle of comforting yourself with things that are causing people to not want to be around you. And it's a, it's a death spiral. Um, so two questions this morning, and I, I, yes, if we were one-on-one, you could break this down even deeper. There's so much power in what I'm sharing with you today. I'm going to take a few weeks to unpack it, and it's actually the work that actually happens at the altar. It's the deep work. It's the deep work of renewing your mind so that you can test and approve what God's will is for you instead of living with a mind that's just conforming to the pattern of this world and staying stuck in a stronghold with many gods occupying your heart. Are y'all with me today? Is this connecting with anybody? I know it is. So I'm going to give you two stronghold questions today. And the first question is this, what is a stronghold? What is a stronghold? And so it's, it's a definition that I'm going to back up. I'm going to walk through a little bit, but I'm going to give you what a stronghold is. And then I'm going to break down how to actually tear it down, how to destroy that. Okay. And it's not like you do it one time and it's over. No, it's an ongoing daily discipline of renewing your mind all the time, especially if you renew your mind and then go look at other stuff or go, open your, go into the world at all because you're automatically going to get all these invitations of conform, 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 but you've got to stay at the altar. Are y'all with me? Okay, so what is a stronghold? Here's a definition, a technical definition of a stronghold. Okay, it's a well-fortified or well-defended place. That's what it is. So when King David occupied a territory, he fortified it. That's why the walls of Jericho were so high. It was fortifying a high place. That's why the the temple mound and the walls around the city of Jerusalem, that's why the western wall, eastern wall, all they have gates. They're fortresses. They're like the big, big, huge systems are set there to protect. That's why the Capitol, the White House, all the, there's people occupy high places and they fortify the high places. So what I want to tell you right now is no demon in hell likes this message. Inside you right now, I just know this. There's all kinds of anxiety. You have voices going off in your head. Please feel safe. I'm not going to expose anybody. I'm not going to like point. I'm not going to point you out. I'm not going to shame you in front of your wife or your husband. I'm not going to shame you in front of your parents. I'm, I'm not doing that. I'm letting you know we're all thinking this today. If he gets a little bit more specific. I, I'm, I'm going to be nervous, but I'm just going to sit here real still so nobody in this room thinks that I know he's talking to me. <laughs> All right, so just relax. Just relax. Like, I'm, I'm the most messed up one in the room. Just, just relax, okay? And so the reality is that a strong, it's a well-fortified, well-defended place. Like, we all have the same brain. Memory is ruts. It's deep ruts. 
We remember smells. How many of y'all can remember like the moment you smell, come on, something cooking? You, it takes you all the way back to grandma's house or all the way back to this. When I smell grass, I immediately think of 7th, 8th, ninth grade football. Immediately. Freshly cut grass reminds me of good things. When I smell dirt, I remember gardening. I remember these smells trigger. The issue was that everything that was designed to remind you of God's glory also reminds you of shame, sin, people, behaviors. And so a spiritual mortif- a metaphor is a stronghold, a stronghold is a habit or a mindset that's fortified by deceptive spirits. Y'all with me? Yeah? Yep. I love those amens on the back row. Come on, brother. It's also a strong and deeply rooted belief system that people either hold on to willingly or unwillingly. Or knowingly and willfully or unknowingly. So you're, you're, everything in your life is there because the best version of you is keeping it there. Write that down. Everything unwanted in your life right now is there because the best version of you is keeping it there. You're like, that's not true. Yes, it is. And what the best version of you could be a literal 14-year-old level of maturity, and that might be the best you can bring to the table. So today, you're not going to get better by beating that 14-year-old self up. You're just not. You're not. The Spirit of Christ in you has got to grow you up, and that's what it means to take thoughts captive and make them obedient to Christ. But no thought in you wants to be taken captive. It's there because you've kept it there for a long, long time. Matthew chapter 12, verse 43 through through 45 says this, When an evil spirit leaves a person, it goes into the desert, seeking rest but finding none. And then it says, I'll return to the person I came from. This is Jesus talking. So it returns and finds the former home empty and swept and in order. Sounds like somebody actually took a whole lot of thoughts captive and kicked them out. Are you with me? Then the spirit finds seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they all enter the person and live there so that person is worse off than before. Has anybody ever experienced even a day like this? Were you... I mean, everybody, be honest, like you have. Like, have you ever felt like, okay, I, I, got a, I, got a, I got a head, I got dressed, I went to the gym, and I actually got out of the car this time. Come on, somebody. <laughs> and I went in, and I'm, I did some work. I did a workout. And I went home, and but I'm not going to eat that. And then I'm, I'm not going to eat that. And by 8 o'clock, you ate everything in the whole cabinet, like everything in the whole kitchen. It's like, where'd those spirits come from? Every person that's actually dealt with, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm never, They set up all this clean house. I'm going to cleanse house. I'm going to do a detox. I'm going to do this. I'm going to clean house. It's no longer, no more, no more. And then all of a sudden, it's like, like, oh, yeah, you kicked us out. But you haven't occupied the space. What I've learned is that the devil loves emptying when you empty yourself and don't know how to refill. Matthew says this in Matthew 6, verse 24. It says this, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Everybody say mammon. That if you decide, I'm going to actually put God first, and I'm not going to bow down to the spirit of riches, wealth, and money, and protection, provision, and all that anymore. That's the number one competition with God is, is mammon. Not money, mammon. People say money talks. No, it doesn't. Mammon talks. Mammon's the spirit on your money. It's the spirit of riches. It's that voice that actually says, you know. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 19 says this, people are slaves to whatever has mastered them. So if I can just give you a, a gentle definition of a stronghold, it's a mastery system. It's the system that masters you. So when Paul says, therefore, in view of God's mercy, brothers, I urge you then, Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice to God, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not any longer conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He's describing what's called spiritual warfare. He's describing the intentional work of identifying. These are the patterns of my life that are conforming to something other than Christ. 
I'm not going to fight against them. I'm just going to get Christ in the right place and let him fight all those things that are coming against my own self. That, that's what it says. So I want to give you, I'm going I'm to introduce these things to you. I actually preached a whole message on this in the past in a series on marriage and relationships. But I want to give you a, a few, just a few what's called spirits. And these are spirits that are actually mentioned in the Bible. You're going to see them immediately. When you see the, the actual spirit and the definition beside it, there's lots of verses and context around it all. I'm just going to expose you to a few things, okay, that are mentioned in Scripture. And if you're like, okay, I don't even know what pattern to arrest. Well, here's a few to start with. Here's one. It's the spirit of infirmity. The spirit of infirmity is, is a, it's a voice that's occupying your, your mind and your heart. And at some point in time, the access was ongoing chronic sickness and biological weakness. There's something inside of you that's perpetually always whispering to you, something's wrong with you physically. You're not well. You're not right. It feeds opioid addictions. It feeds putting, medicating yourself to sleep. Don't get uncomfortable. Just realize we're all, we all have our own stuff, okay? And this is a house of, of worship. It's a house of praise. We're all broken. We're all, come on, how many of y'all would agree? Like we're all messed up. We're just at different levels of recovery. Come on, can I get a witness? All right, yeah, we're all, we all are. So don't, don't, get, don't feel shame with this today. There's power today coming. There's power coming. A, a second one is the spirit of timidity. And Paul encourages Timothy, we've not been given a spirit of timidity, but a power, love, and a sound mind. Timidity is different than fear. Timidity is actual cowardice. It's a coward spirit. It surges of cowardice, and it's intimidated by conflict or rejection. Like literally, if you just won't, or you're not doing what God's calling you to do because you're afraid of something or afraid of people saying this or this happening to you, there's a coward spirit in you that pops up and it just keeps you, it keep, it, it's the high place in your heart. Timidity. The third one is what's called the spirit of Python. This is that, that girl that was actually trying to intimidate Paul and Silas on the road to, in Philippi. As they were preaching or proclaiming the gospel, there was this choking spirit, and this girl really had it. She starts doing all these things, a spirit of python, that's what it called her. It's like a spirit of divination. It was like this powerful choking spirit is what it was. And literally like the whole, it was trying to choke the gospel out is what it was. And what actually broke that was Paul and Silas not being choked out, but worshiping in a prison cell. And for some of you, you literally have your voice choked to speak truth or to speak your own witness of Christ. And there's just something about it. It's just a fear of rejection that comes or this whole, I just don't want to go, I don't want to suffer because of what I want to say. And I'm just telling you, I'm submitting to you that there's a need for you to go to the altar and get rid of the power, that choking power, that python type spirit that just squeezes your voice when you have something to say and you don't want to fight or you don't want to get into an argument or you don't want to, that, that, that you're like, I just keep getting choked out. Haughtiness. Haughtiness is this, is this arrogance, and I put the alternative there of humble yourself and worship Jesus, but haughtiness is, is it's the root of all narcissism. It's the root of narcissism. I, I mean, I hear it everybody, everywhere today. Almost everybody that comes to therapy is like, I'm married to a narcissist. Everybody's talking about married to a narcissist. And I was like, my, like, narcissism is everywhere. Narcissism is basically finding reasons to worship yourself. That's what it is. And punishing people who don't. And so if you're consistently pumping yourself up and boosting yourself up and rejecting people who don't bow down to you, that's, that's narcissism, but it's a spirit of haughtiness. It's a haughty spirit. It's the spirit that actually, of pride, that actually leveled the whole thinking pattern of the devil himself to being higher than God. A haughty spirit always has a lower mountain for God and a higher mountain for self. It's a haughty spirit. You, got, you humble yourself before the Lord and he'll lift you up. If you lift yourself up, you're in trouble. Lust. That's not like just being hungry. Lust is an insat a, a desire to satisfy and reward your cravings with created things. That's what lust is. It's the opposite of contentment. Contentment is being satisfied in the presence of God with who he is and wh who you are and what he's given you. It's me being content with always with the size of the church, the size of the ministry, the, the number of people. All those things is contentment, genuine contentment. I'm, I'm content with what we have, but it, contentment, contentment is realizing who God is and giving him proper place. That doesn't mean don't work hard. That doesn't mean don't pursue excellence. That doesn't mean don't, don't, don't move forward and advance the gospel and grow in your, in your weaknesses and your limitations and get development. No, 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 no. Contentment is deep, deep, deep satisfaction 
and God himself without an insatiable, an, an, an unsight, I don't even have a word. I, got, I went to LSU, y'all forgive me. I got, like, I got like 11 words in my vocabulary. Come on, somebody. Lust. Lust will never be satisfied with the precious spouse God gave you. Lust won't. It's always think something's better out there. That's a spirit. And it's probably popping up in several areas of your life if it's popping up in one. Bondage, that's the literal, like, that, that is addiction is what it is. We all go to addiction recovery. The Bible calls it bondage. The Bible doesn't have the word addiction in there. It has the word of bondage. It means that you're literally in a pattern that you can't break and you don't know why. And no matter how much science comes up there, it's just not going to break. It's not going to break. It's bondage. You're in a spirit of bondage. That spirit has to be broken. And that spirit isn't broken one time. It's broken all the time at the altar. Perverseness. This is the spirit that's really attacking the entire United States government. It's definitely attacking media. And it has a major stronghold in our definitions of words and our education system. The spirit of perverseness. A perverted spirit is one that intentionally perverts and twists the truth all the time. Like you'll see this in almost every jaded person. Every person that has a jaded personality and just always is kicking the why button, the why button, the why button. Why not? Why not? Why not? It's the same voice that's like kicking the tree of knowledge of good and evil saying, why not? Why not? The only reason you can is because it's going to make you like God. The only reason you can't, it's still always defying authority, always defying God's word, always. It's a perverted spirit. If you have a child that's dealing with a perverted spirit, I promise you, there's going to be there's going to be all kinds of things attacking the life of that child. All kinds of things. You're dealing with a perverse spirit, and the way that you recognize it is that you are you're seeing a draw to things that are twisted and rebellious. It's not that they actually don't obey and don't clean their room. Don't go, come on, come on, don't be like hitting a fly with a sledgehammer. You know what I'm saying? Don't be calling them perverted just because they disobey sometimes. If there's a pattern of intentional, willful, always twisting, questioning, don't even start calling it out. You need to understand that in your family system, you're dealing with a perverse spirit somewhere. And it may be in you. They may have picked up on that in you. I'll show you how to destroy that. The last one is mammon. It's a chronic fear of lack, bowing to the voice of money. And the chronic fear of lack will do what Corinth said, and I'm going to point, I'm going to just, if you're like, I don't want to hear a message on money, don't come next week. I'm, don't come next week. Like, just skip church. I'll know. Everybody that's not here next week, I'll know what spirit you're dealing with. <laughs> we were already going, I'm going to get 100 texts. We were already going to be out of town next week. Right. Eight through ten is all about the spirit of mammon. That spirit of mammon loves your nest egg, loves it, always talks about what you would do if you had, talks, 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 talks generosity, and then finds all kinds of reasons to always protect your comfort zone. Money is your God, period. So the anatomy of a stronghold, experience pain. There's a message. I want to show you how this actually works and how you actually deal with this, and I'll show you how to break it down. All right, ready? Go to the next slide. When you experience discomfort in your life of any, any kind of discomfort, any kind of discomfort, what's happening is there's going to be a warfare is right here. Spiritual warfare happens right here and over here. What churches do is they kick people out of church who comfort themselves with their habits but it's impossible to change a habit until you change this filter. Anchor Church is not interested in changing your habits. We're interested in introducing you to healthy filters. That's what we want to do. Because we know that no punishment of a habit changes the behavior. How many of y'all have ever like, spanked your kid out of an addiction to alcohol? <laughs> you ever grounded somebody and, and beat, beat a porn addiction? <laughs> Have you, have you ever, like, shamed somebody into complying with a rule? Like, shame doesn't work. It actually makes it worse. Shame actually comes into agreement with their filter. You're broken. Something's wrong with you. What's wrong with you? How can you keep on doing this? That's what they already hear in their head. They're not going to stop. 
dis- uh, bad habits don't change until you actually get a, a healthy filter of the gospel of Christ. Now, what, what do we, if you actually said, where is spiritual warfare? Where do we arrest thoughts? We arrest thoughts at the message level. We arrest thoughts as, why, that's coming in my head. It's not in agreement with the word of God. Here's your challenge. If you don't know the word of God, you're always going to come into agreement with lies. It's going to keep on happening. So, stronghold question two. I'm going to break this down a lot in the next couple of weeks, so let me move on. Stronghold question two, and this is the last one, but it's got a lot of meat under it. Y'all ready? Here it is. What does a stronghold have to do with at the altar? Just say that with me out loud. What does a stronghold have to do with at the altar? Okay? So I want to give you a statement. You take a picture of it, and then I'm going to break it down with an example of what just one, pa- one chapter in the Bible, and it's going to be Psalm 18, if you want to turn over there. Psalm 18, we're going to break down that whole psalm, and you're going to look at it, and you're going to be like, man, I didn't even know this was in the Bible. I didn't even know this was here. That's what's going to happen, and it's going to actually get you started in a process of doing what's called real, real spiritual warfare in your life at the altar, and you'll, you'll understand it more over the next uh, few weeks, okay? So here's the statement. Demolishing strongholds is spiritual warfare. Demolishing strongholds is spiritual warfare. Strongholds are high lofty opinions that set itself up against the knowledge of God. The evidence of a stronghold is unwanted behavior that's just chronically happening in your life. You're lacking power and authority in any area. That's why like altar moments are always available. We're always in the, at the altar, always, because we're always submitting our will to Christ. We always are. Every one of, everybody in here does this. You're just like, how are they so healthy? It seems like, no, 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 I promise, they are at the altar all the time. If you're like, man, how do they have a good marriage? How do they, I promise, one or two of them is at the altar all the time. You're like, front of church? No, 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 no. In their heart, there's always this submission of their will to the will of the Father. That's how anybody stays married. Can I get an amen? <laughs> Somebody's at the altar. Like, how did you make it through the hardest years of your marriage? Somebody was at the altar. Somebody was praying. Somebody was sacri- Somebody was staying longer than they felt like. Somebody was laying down their will for a higher purpose. Somebody was uncomfortable for the sake of the whole. Someone was choosing discomfort in submission to Jesus. Why? Because he took on the cross. And you're like, I can do this. Not as the Savior, but as a person that's refusing to give foothold to the devil, all right? So spiritual warfare is one at the altar, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a little pattern. And this is what we're going to work through the next couple of weeks, all right? You feel like, this coaching with Jeff. No, no, no. I'm just bringing you into what I do myself. I literally sat in my office this morning. Sarah walked in and, and like literally told her, babe, this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm, what, what. And I really feel like this is going to be so, a really big win for our family if we do this, this, and this. And so we're doing what I'm showing you, okay? So here we go. Spiritual warfare at the altar, here's what it breaks down to, to three categories. Number one is prayer, okay? And that's what we set up early. We set this up earlier. This is praise and faith declarations. These are the three things I'm going to unpack today. Prayer, confession and repentance together, and worship. You're like, okay, show us how this works. Well, this is exactly what I've shown you the last couple of weeks with the tabernacle and the temple. Are you all with me? If you're like, I'm new here, I've never heard any of this, okay, just a real quick introduction. The Bible is loaded with language of enter the presence of God with thanksgiving in your heart. Enter his courts with praise. Well, as soon as you enter into the tabernacle or the temple in Old Testament, you come straight to what's called the brazen altar. That's the place of washing. That's confession and repentance. That's the place of sacrifice, of coming into agreement, laying down sin, receiving the work of Christ, receiving the renewing of your mind. Then there's going into the holy place, and that's where the bread and the word is. And all of these things are like, a, it's a pattern of worship. I've shrunk this down into three categories because I like three. Prayer, worship, confession and repentance, worship. All right, so what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to walk you through a book in the Bible that was written by King David, and it's Psalm 18. It's the best book in the whole Bible, the best chapter in the whole Bible on strongholds. And all I want you to do is like just follow with me, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to be very encouraging to you. Okay, Psalm 18, verse 2, it says this. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield 
and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. What he says is the Lord is my well-protected, fortified high place. He is. He is. So spiritual warfare is going to him and saying, God, get rid of everything that's not you. Everything. Do war with me in revealing what's not you, and I willingly submit it. I'm wrestling with you. I'm like, Lord, are you better than this? Like, this actually helps me right now. Like, like talk to me, God. You look at rock. That's a firm foundation. That's what, you, that's what you stabilizes your life. Have you ever used the phrase, like, she's my rock? Have you ever used that phrase? What you're actually saying, without knowing it, I'm not shaming anybody. What you're saying is that if that leaves, you're a mess. And if in your life right now, if you have anything that if it leaves and you're a mess, then you've got your hope rooted in something that's not meant to outlast you, not meant to satisfy you, and there's a greater rock. You're like, that's pretty mean, Pastor Jeff. Like, my kids are everything to me. That may be your problem. My husband is everything to me. He's your God. If I lost my job, I don't know what I would do. I don't either. But that doesn't mean that you have to worship that security. And here's all I'm submitting to you, is that every single one of us have faulty foundations. And the goal is this, it's praise, the Lord is my rock. Come on, say that whole part out loud. Just say that, get this in your lips today. I, I want to start off every day with this. This is like a, a pattern, a habit. Just say it, read it out loud with me, everybody. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. A horn of salvation literally is a shofar. The horn means to roar. It's the roar. Whenever Zacharias was in the, the temple, when John the Baptist was, but what he said is John the Baptist is the horn of salvation. He's, the, he's preparing the way, like he's the one preparing the way. But what he's saying is like the shofar, the horn of my salvation, the declaration to all the other gods is, God is my God. That intensity is warfare. Money, mammon, God is my God. And God says, yeah. Well, let's, let's talk about the patterns from here now. What you don't want is a horn of salvation and a life that's empty. What you want is your whole life to come into alignment with your horn of salvation and really, really build a, re build a real stronghold. What he's saying there is like a sword. This is like a Maasai sword, but you'll, you'll see this in a second. But what he starts describing is that the horn of my salvation actually determines my warfare, how I fight battles. Read, read, this, read the last part with me on verse, on verse 30 out loud. Ready? As for God, his way is perfect. The Lord's word is flawless. You believe that? You'd be surprised how many people come to church and we actually have a statement on our website that we believe in the inerrant word of God. They're like, oh, there's errors. No, 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 no. Like if you, if you, if you are putting lofty opinions against the direct word of God, you have all kinds of trouble. You're like, I cannot come to a church that believes that the Word of God is the Word of God. <laughs> Listen, y'all are laughing, man, but you'd be surprised how many people find all kinds of loopholes to argue of why the Bible don't mean what it says. They look for reasons. Oh, I'm not, I'm not tithing. That was an Old Testament thing. You don't understand that Jesus is the tithe? You're like, well, I already tithe. I'm, reti I'm retired and I've got all this. So, so you're living on interest from your nest egg, which means your nest egg is still increasing. And you, you, you don't bring God glory for the increase anymore because you've already done that? Well, if I knew I had to tithe, I would have built my nest egg bigger. <laughs> Who's your God? What do you trust in? Like the very basic foundation of trusting God is with the very first first fruits of every single thing that touched your hand. Like it's the first thing. Jesus is the tithe of God. He gave his very first, very best, and Jesus gave all. The New Testament standard is everything. Tithing is like the foundation. Like your goal is to give everything to the Lord. That's the goal. You're like, that's not in the Bible. It is in the Bible. The Lord's word is flawless, and he shields all who take refuge in him. For who is God besides the Lord, and who is the rock except our God? Number two is confession and repentance. 
confession and repentance. And what I want to encourage you with is this. I want to encourage you to wrestle until you come into agreement with God. <laughs> like if you know God's God, then don't wrestle with him until you win. Because you're going to leave God. You're going to actually leave being God. You're going to leave with a higher opinion than God. If you actually get in a conversation with God and you start wrestling with God and you leave right and God wrong, you lost. If you get in an argument with God about why you shouldn't do or can't do what God's word says and you come leaving God saying, yeah, God, I figured out another way besides you, you lost the fight. You lost. You win. You win the fight when you come into agreement with God. You're like, Ugh. That's what I have a problem with. I know. That's the foundation of your stronghold is you really believe you're God and you know better. That's the real wrestling match of at the altar. The purpose of the altar is laying you down so God can raise him up in you. That's the purpose of the altar. That's the purpose of worship. Look at these verses, Ephesians chapter 6. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities and against the cosmic powers over this present darkness and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So he's acknowledging that there's a wrestling match, and it's a spiritual wrestling match. It really may, and I'm, I keep using the spirit of mammon because it's the, most, it's the only thing Jesus said that you can't serve both God and mammon. It's like there's a, it's a competing spirit. Mammonos is a competing spirit. It's the spirit of, of riches and wealth. It is. And it's what everybody depends in to stay comfortable as long as they can while they're here on earth. And that's a competing deal. And so how do you beat that? You surrender it all to God and let him lift you up. And you'll feel the difference when you do it. Romans chapter 8, verse 13. For if you live according to the flesh... You will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. So there's a spiritual warfare. It's, it's really by the, I'm going to invite the worship team to come up. Spiritual warfare is that process of by the Spirit putting to death the misdeeds of the body. I'm like, well, what is a misdeed, Pastor Jeff? Anything set up against the truth of God. Anything. This is a hard teaching. I know. I deal with it every day. Every day. Well, what if you don't, like, get better fast? Well, then you're a lot like me. You're a lot like me. I'm not beating you up saying I'm perfect in spiritual warfare, but what I'm telling you is I never stop wrestling with God. Romans 12, verse 1, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is what I want to do. I want to offer him my body, my life. He skills my hands for battle. He strengthens my arms for war. He does all that. And so I want to do it at the altar. I don't want to just go get a self-help system that makes me a better person. I don't want to start some mastermind group and get self-help bull junk. Come on, somebody. <laughs> I'm not a cussing pastor. I don't, I don't want to be a self-help church. I want to be an altar church. I want to be a church that's changed at the altar and the Holy Spirit of God's conforming us, not some kind of thing that man gets credit for and some book sale helps. I want God. The final one is worship. Worship. It's worship. I didn't put anything beside worship. <laughs> because you won't know worship until you're free. You won't know it. And what happens for me is every single day that God sets me free from one stronghold, my worship just gets messy. <laughs> like, thank you, God. Thank you. I wasn't even expecting this. I didn't know this day would get this good. I honor you. I adore you. I praise you. Of course there's nobody but you, God. Of course there's no one who knows me better than you. And I lay this down. It's a constant act of my will in Psalm 18, verse 40 through uh, the, the following verses, 33 and following. It says, he makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He causes me to stand on the heights. He trains my hands for battle. My arms can bend the bow of bronze. You, ma you make your saving help my shield, and your right hand sustains me. Your help has made me great. You provide a broad path for my feet so that my ankles do not give way. I pursued my enemies. Come on, read this out loud with me. I pursued my enemies. Put it up there. Ready? I pursued, I pursued my enemies. Everybody read it out loud. Ready? I pursued my enemies 
enemies and overtook them. I did not turn back till they were destroyed. I crushed them so that they could not rise. They fell beneath my feet. You armed me with strength for battle. You humbled my adversaries before me. You made my enemies turn their back in flight, and I destroyed my foes. Then they cried for help, but there was no one to save them. To the Lord, but he did not answer. I beat them as a fine windblown dust. I trampled them like mud in the streets. Read the very last statement. Look at this, the very last part of, of, of Psalm 18. Put that last verse up there. The very last, yeah. The Lord lives. It's almost like he wins this battle and then looks up and is like, the Lord wins king of the hill. The Lord won. He won today. He won in my marriage today. He won in my health today. He won in my finances today. He won in my kids today. He won in my parenting today. The Lord lives. Praise be to my rock. Exalted be God, my Savior. Come on, say that whole part out loud. The Lord lives. Come on, say it out loud. The Lord lives. Come on, shout it. Ready? The Lord lives. Praise be to my rock. Exalted be God, my Savior. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. This is what it's like to come to the altar. It's not a space at the front of a room. It's a place of worship. It's wherever you are. It's the floor beside your bed. It's the floor beside your children's bed. It's your front porch at your house. It's the front seat of your truck. It's inside the cabin of your tractor. It's on your horse. It's in your office, at your desk. It's looking out the windows of your business, wondering what it's going to take to finally get your nest egg ready. That's your place of your altar. That's the place where your gods collide with the one true God, and he wants the high place wherever you are. Amen. Hey, thank you for watching Anchor Church YouTube. I want you to subscribe so that we can let you know when we go live and also when we post new content. Make sure also to leave a comment. Let us know what ministered to you today. Also, let us know where you're watching from and how we can pray for you. And finally, if you'd like to support Anchor right now, you can click the link below and your partnership will help impact so many others. I'll see you next time, my friend. God bless you and best ahead.